At this point, we want to continue our discussion of evolution by talking about a couple of closely related topics that we need to understand to understand evolution, and then talking about a little bit about the history of Darwin. So, natural selection is a term that we'll cover more in the next chapter. We'll talk about different types of natural selection. But natural selection is a relatively simple idea. It's simply this. <clears throat> it's the idea that in the environment, survival and reproduction of organisms is not random. Those organisms that are best suited to the environment survive and therefore reproduce, although those two things are not always uh, just a, a close correlation, but typically they are. And this means that uh, a certain type, a certain phenotype of organism is selected for as you go from generation to generation uh, in this particular species of organism in the environment. And so this is a process that allows populations to adapt. And we use the term adapt uh, to mean that the organisms become well suited to the environment in which they live. And of course, the simple explanation for that is that only the organisms that are well adapted to that environment are surviving and or reproducing. And so we see this um, as a, an example. As examples, we see uh, pesticide-resistant uh, insects uh, that consume crops. And so the first year that a farmer uses an insecticide on a field, then 99% of the insects are, are killed. The next year, a lower percentage are killed. And within a, within a decade, in some cases, that insecticide may be almost useless uh, for that particular insect. Um, and so that's simply a result of the fact that all the organisms, all the insects in this case, that are susceptible to the insecticide die, the ones that are resistant survive, and, and so you can see how that occurs. Um, antibiotic resistance is another great example, um, and so antibiotic resistance is, is a very uh, serious problem today in the medical community. You may have heard of, of people having uh, infections from so-called superbugs, um, and these are bacteria that have uh, been selected uh, to be resistant to antibiotics and so it's this is a very widespread problem and, and a very uh, widely observed problem uh, the uh, original some of the original antibiotics like penicillin G for instance uh, penicillin in its uh, basically its original form are really not that effective uh, today as re in any scenario as a result of the fact that so many bacteria are resistant to it um, and so this means that we as humans need to continually uh, come up with new antibiotics uh, to combat uh, bacteria. Um, so antibiotic resistance is something that you'll hear about frequently and really is uh, quite a big deal in the medical community. So we want to distinguish at this point between microevolution and macroevolution. What I just described would typically be referred to as microevolution. Microevolution are changes that occur uh, within a species and they're, they're typically easily observed. Um, you can do experiments in the lab. Our, our book later in uh, the next chapter will have an example of an experiment that took place over two years that looked at the resistance of fruit flies to uh, ethanol. Um, and there was a very distinct and, and dramatic, almost 180 degree change in the resistance of these fruit flies to ethanol over a very short time period, uh, relatively speaking, two years. Macroevolution is different. Macroevolution is the changes that occur in a species that, that are very large uh, in scale. And so in macroevolution we're talking about the transition of one species to another. And this, this requires long, long periods of time. This is not something we can test in the lab. And so macroevolution relies on the fossil record um, and DNA evidence uh, to support the its occurrence. Um, so we do want to distinguish between microevolution, which is easily observed, um, and can be demonstrated quite uh, simply in macroevolution, which cannot be observed because it takes such long uh, periods of time. Now, I also want to spend a bit of time, uh, as our book does, talking about the, the use of the word theory. Um, and so it's very common in our world to uh, use the word theory in a very flippant way to uh, talk about a, a very tentative explanation for some occurrence. Um, you may hear say hear people say that they have a theory that it only rains when they don't have an umbrella or something like that, um, which is kind of a, a silly usage of the term. But the word, the, the point that we want to make is that the word theory is used in a very different way in common day-to-day -day usage as opposed to how it's applied in science. In science, when we use the word theory, 
we're talking very specifically about a particular hypothesis that's been tested over and over and over again and proved to be correct in, in every case. And so oftentimes people will say, well, we don't want to put too much emphasis on this particular aspect of science because it's only a theory. But what, what they don't realize is that a theory is actually um, a hypothesis that has a tremendous amount of evidence behind it to indicate that it is uh, in fact uh, correct. Alright, and so what is evolution then? Evolution is a theory and evolution is the idea that one organism can transition into other organisms given uh, sufficient uh, time and so in this particular graph we have what we refer to as a phylogenetic tree. A phylogenetic tree shows the evolutionary history of a group of organisms. It's basically a family tree for a group of organisms. And so on the, the y-axis there uh, we have time and you'll notice that we have thousands of generations there and so tremendous amounts of time pass in order to allow this to occur. On the bottom of this tree we have a common ancestor and then the idea is that this common ancestor splits into many different um, species as time goes on. And so as an, as an example, you know, what this might be discussing, we could have, for instance, a, a family of fish that would fit into a phylogenetic tree very similar to this. And of course you realize when I say family, I'm talking about the scientific uh, classification of family. We have genus, uh, starting at the lowest level, we have species, genus, and then just above that we have family. And so a family of fish, as an, an example of a family of fish, might be centrarchids, otherwise known as sunfish. And so if you go to a pond or you go to a stream and you catch bluegill, that's an example of, of a sunfish. And so there are 14 or 15 different types of sunfish that are found uh, here even in just Kentucky. And the, our best evidence indicates that there was a common ancestor at one point that gave rise to all of these different um, sunfish. And so this is the idea of evolution. We want to talk briefly about Charles Darwin. And so certainly you've heard of Darwin. We want to spend just a moment. We're not going to go into tremendous depth on it, but our book gives us a brief overview of who Darwin is and, and his contribution to science. And so we want to talk about that for just a moment. So the theory of evolution is sometimes called Darwinism simply because of his role in introducing this idea. And very specifically, the idea that he introduced was this, that evolution occurs via natural selection. And so he made some observations regarding natural selection, and he hypothesized that over given sufficient periods of time, one organism could give rise to a diversity of, of organisms. Darwin didn't invent this idea, uh, but he was the first person to uh, put these ideas down in writing uh, in the form of a book. Uh, that was widely uh, read and widely uh, cited. And so several experiences in Darwin's life led him to come to these conclusions. And so at a very young age, uh, he was uh, hired as a so-called naturalist aboard a ship that uh, the, the famous uh, HMS Beagle that went on this five-year trip. And it was probably a great job. His job was to simply collect notes uh, on the organisms, the plants and animals that uh, were present at the various uh, ports or locations in which this ship stopped. And so on the left hand side on our screen you can see the voyage of the Beagle. And although the, the Beagle went to many different places, the most significant place um, that uh, Darwin collected observations from was a, a place referred to as the Galapagos Islands that you can see um, in the uh, towards the left hand side of our, our diagram there. And the Galapagos Islands um, were a very um, perfect natural laboratory for evolution to take place. And, and we'll look on the next slide at, at the observations Darwin made here in the Galapagos Islands. And uh, so Darwin visited the rainforest of Brazil. He also collected fossils, although our knowledge of fossils at that time was relatively limited, so he had not a, didn't have a great deal of interpretation uh, of those fossils. Um, but the birds and reptiles of the Galapagos Islands were one of the most significant um, observations that he made on this journey. So he saw things like these giant tortoises, these big gigantic turtles that you see little kids riding on in zoos. Uh, 
uh, on the Galapagos Islands. These are, are tur turtles that live a tremendously long period of time and grow to huge sizes. And what he noticed was that the shells, what he noticed in general was that animals were different on different islands in the Galapagos. In the case of the turtles, the shell was different. Some turtles had a very high arched dome uh, shell like the turtle on the left. Others had a much flatter shell like the turtle on the right. And so he also looked at finches, and his most widely known observations probably had to do with these finches. And so the idea of the Galapagos and, and the animals found there is as follows here. So the Galapagos Islands are shown here in our diagram, shown on the right-hand side of our screen, and they're just the right distance apart uh, for evolution to occur for this particular reason. They're close enough together that they were colonized, for instance, by these finches. You know, they're close close enough uh, to to the mainland. Actually, let me say that, that they can be colonized by finches. So here we have this this big uh, mainland, and here we have all these little islands out here. And so when there was a storm, birds would blow uh, every now and then. There would be a storm strong enough to blow birds from the mainland out to these islands. And so the birds got to the islands at some point in history but they were far enough apart that those birds couldn't fly back to the mainland or they couldn't fly from island to island. And so what he saw was that there was a species of bird on the mainland shown here in the middle of our picture and then down here in our actual photograph and that bird blew from the mainland out to all of these little islands colonizing all the islands. Each of the islands had different conditions. This was the other aspect of the Galapagos Islands that really made this a perfect natural laboratory. And so the birds adapted to the conditions found in the islands, not for any really complex reason, but simply because the birds that were well adapted uh, to that particular uh, condition or food source found in the island survived and the others did not. And you may say, well, I thought it was the same species that blew out to all those islands. And that's true, but within a species, as we've talked about previously in our class, you realize there's a certain amount of genetic variation that exists. And so this means that one end of the phenotype or the other end was selected for based on the conditions on the island. And so then over a period of, of most likely thousands of years, from the original species you end up with a bunch of uh, birds that, that are actually considered di different species. And so some of them are adapted uh, because of their beak shape to eating things like fruit, Others eat leaves, others eat insects, others eat grubs. Some of them even use uh, little tools to get uh, insects out of holes in, uh, in wood. And, uh, and by tools, I mean just a, a little twig that, that they pick up. Um, and so that's the idea of evolution by natural selection. And this was the, one of the primary observations that Darwin made that led him to the conclusion that organisms adapt to their environment and over long periods of time, one common ancestor could give rise to a number of different species. Darwin returned to England in 1836, but he didn't publish his ideas for about 20 years or so. Another very significant observation that he made that contributed to these ideas was uh, the um, observation of agricultural animals, as we've talked about previously in our class, and the fact that uh, that something occurs that we commonly refer to as artificial selection. And so people want cows that will produce lots of milk, so they, they select uh, the highest milk producers. Or people want cows that grow fast uh, to, to make into beef, and so they select the ones that, that grow the fastest. And so these ideas reinforced um, his initial observations that given enough time, selective breeding could change uh, a species and change an organism from one appearance to another and of course that's how we have all these different species uh, of domestic animals um, today. Of course in the case of domestic animals it's humans that are making the choice to, to breed an organism. In the case of, of wild organisms it's the environment uh, that is imposing uh, the selection because of the food source or the habitat or, or the colors uh, that are present there in the environment.